Uh, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really nervous. But um, uh, yeah, so you'll notice if you go to the uh, installation upstairs, there's a lot of poetry from each of the poets here tonight um, on the floor. And so recently I had read this poem that I'm about to read, An Infected Sunset, um, at this outdoor indigenous run gallery in just north of Kamloops, British Columbia. Um, it's organized and put together by this indigenous First Nations artist up in Canada, Tanya Willard. Um, <laughs> she is really fucking rad. And so she invited me to come out and engage in the land up there. Um, and so I read this poem for the land and as I read the poem, I left um, all the sheets up there as an offering. So I kind of think of the the poems that exist up there as an offering and in, in, in so far as after the exhibition, um, we plan to either repaste them or put them in public spaces where they're less likely to be disturbed and become a natural part of the city um, as an offering to like the indigenous energy and ancestries uh, throughout like this whole region. Um, and with that, I'll just lead into this poem. Uh, this poem starts off, the, the first three sections of it is, is like contemplating my time down at like the gay, gay nude beach river in Portland, this place called Rooster Rock. Um, but also like every, during that whole time, like everything at Standing Rock is happening. Um, so at the point where this poem, where, where I'm gonna read off of it, um, I have just like talked about like the entire effects of Standing Rock and how indigenous resistance is like a form of ceremony um, that colonizers and um, European descendants just can't seem to understand. Um, so here we go. As I leave the river, I receive a text message from Ginger. Her and her family drove to Standing Rock to bring supplies and offer their solidarity and energies. She tells me that nations are uniting and shifting consciousness on a global scale, that outside action brings light to this and all the desire of similar actions of environmental racism that must be actively engaged beyond Standing Rock. And I remember desire, a memory within my body, my ancestry, desire to speak even when no one is around, even when no one is around to listen, even when there is no paper in sight, even when the words get carried off in the, in the breeze desire that gets mistaken, lost, misplaced, stolen, colonized, desire for resistance. Four, night driving back to the res, Patsy Cline coming in clean over the radio. So I imagine my grandmother first ever hearing her voice. She's all silver and turquoise, her Diné skirt making red dirt rise from the floor of the Hogan, but being Diné, she won't do much walking after midnight. I miss the smell of poverty, broken English, never English, something before it, something still colonial in the pronunciation. My body moves like this ancestor. The words trickle off the tongue like a suppressed memory. Your memory, suppressed memory, night in shining armor, the night you were molested as dark as the cave in the canyon wall, bullets and light ricocheting off the sandstone lining of this sanctuary, like a machete ripping through human flesh, distilling screams into moans that become soft noises into silence. Keon finishes a bad hookup with a client, says lunch is on them because they revel in having the money to be courteous, because in this economy, money affords us moments of gratitude. We talk about insurrection and queer sex and death politics. We talk about borders and laws and heterosexuality and archaic praxis. We get in a man-made raft and paddle down Shit's Creek, talking about the threat of HIV and AIDS and having babies and overpopulation. Then we turn over a rotting log that reveals the equivalence between death and life, or the differences between heterosexuality and homosexuality. Because for some of us, heterosexuality means death. You want your body to soothe, the moon to come into focus. You want to be a body that soothes. You understand when a friend is in need of healing and his only form of self-protection is sexual gratification. Dan leaves the door open. He's wearing a jock strap. He says so in the pictures because he saw it on the internet. An angle like so many angles, like all those gorilla angles and fallen angels that draw you into their interweb. History tells me I'm lonesome for non-history. 
says I should read more books and get a master's degree, says I should, says I should cut my hair so white women won't exoticize me, says not to swim in that polluted water polluted by the colonizers. History takes me home one night, and the next six months I can't stop thinking about death. It starts one night when I'm looking out the window of my family's old powwow Dodge van, the one we never wore seatbelts in because it was the 80s, the one where I'd crawl at my mother's feet and try to go to sleep. My father's driving us home after a basketball game on the res. I'm looking out the tinted windows at the stars, and suddenly I comprehend my mortality like a sin, like maybe I need to, co like maybe I need to confess, as if this revelation was the equivalence of guilt, like maybe I should be a better Catholic because I want to get into heaven, because maybe then my, sk my skin will be white, because all the pictures say so. A white man's heaven doesn't need light, but has it in abundance, because God made it so, so, so fucking easy. Easier than white boys, easier than married men who fuck fags, easier than fags who fuck Republicans, easier than it is to see who has the real power in these situations when you subvert submission and turn it into a tool of power. After a week of thinking about signing my life away to the Vatican, I realize the thought of eternity frightens me. The concept alone, eternal life, heaven, is one big fucking nightmare. Atomic bomb on the moon, sun scorching the earth, reptilian, Stepford, Nostradamus, hollow earth, Illuminati, computer simulated paranoid theory. You want to be a body that sues lost boys, queer boys and strange mercy, sex between the anxiety attacks, between a polyamorous couple, between masculine and I don't give a fuck, between a carved decomposing dead tree, water from the hot springs, candles, semen, dead skin, the weight of your body against my chest, water is life, water is ceremony, water running around my head down your back between the stone carved out from the vibration of human voices. Whenever I want to imagine being the teeth on the machine that rips through the teeth, the flesh of ancient trees, Whenever I want to imagine the vibration or marvel at the glory of man-made disaster machines that are mere extensions of our predatory self-sabotaging minds, I walk over to the bookshelf and pick up a coffee-stained degenerative second-hand copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. I get about a few pages in before I abandon the prose and surrender the worth of his words to gravity. As the book closes midair, the cover ridicules me and lands face up. The offensive evolution of the, of the desirability of a bearded white man stares back at me like a racist profile on Grindr. Yet as he sings his two-dimensional body into existence, I decolonize these Western homonormative objectives, and I sing my body majestic. I sing his masculine prototype deceptive as my ancestors declare my existence sacred. It's important in these moments to remember my father, grandfathers, uncles, and cousins, and all the indigenous men wearing tight blue jeans, some with hair that stretches all the way down to their asses, some cut clean with a razor like boarding school days, indigenous Diné men with straight white teeth that smile through generations of wounded white men and make you lose all sense of direction. Sometimes I'm not trying to decolonize shit, but then I remember the way love rolls thick around an indigenous body. When I talk about this continent, I'm talking about a brown body. When I'm talking about genocide or romanticizing history, I'm talking about a white body. I can't help it. It's been ingrained to me like a branding, was the world I was born into, was the cause of headache, starvation, sexual appetite, and no satisfaction, shame, trauma, and insatiable hunger, teeth gripping human skin, the evolution of the crucifixion of Christ. I don't got time to deconstruct my reality. You want to call it sensor reality with your weakened senses or my weakened post-colonial immune system only to be interrupted because my story isn't the majority and I just want to call it what it is by calling it what it is. Colonization, a cancerous colon, calling it what it is like I call a rigged election, like an erectile dysfunction, electoral college racist malfunction because slavery is the imprisonment of powerful bodies that cannot be silenced, because late one night when I'm forgetting the trauma that this body has endured through my own history and that of my ancestors, I suddenly remember that these are not your landscapes. These are not your sunsets. These are not your mountains. These are not your rivers to reinfect. These are not your islands and prairies. These are not your insects and animals to dissect. 
Let's talk about Whitney Houston's rendition of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You and how it made it safer to fall in love with white men again, to trust them again, to desire them again, to teach them how to love while devaluing your worth or the worth of your ancestors. How does that type of betrayal save a river from being polluted? How does that type of betrayal cure tumors on salmon, whales, or livestock? How does that type of betrayal liberate rivers from dams or free willy or dismantle oil rigs or the police state or white supremacy or transphobia in a post-internet colonized world? How does that type of betrayal prove its worth to radiant indigenous queers and ensure their survival in spite of heteropatriarchy? Marx is buried in the desert beneath sheets of dirt slabs of indigenous history or non-history or survivance, or knowledge and wisdom and sex. Black Knight's in the back of a pickup. She was born in the back seat. She was conceived during the long walk and her feet do the talking. And all the students reading Karl Marx and Salinger and Derrida could never find a shovel sharp enough to dig through this knowledge and wisdom to cover all the centuries of European bullshit. His legs crushed beneath the weight of a tractor, said someday his entire body would go out or stop working, said his wife was working graveyard at some hospital in some other small town with the Mexican restaurant slinging tortilla chips on another bleak strip mall erected in the 80s. His look gives him away instantly. He's miles away flipping over the handlebars of some makeshift dirt bike, said the only bone he hasn't broken his lanky <laughs> body was his neck said he would do it all over again, said he drove 72 straight hours and that Wyoming was his favorite state. I pull off his camouflage hunting boxer briefs atop his full-size mattress and well-worn sheets. Faux wood paneling is like its own camouflage or the, ro or the floral rose wallpaper lining his bathroom. And I wonder if he ever found himself an urban cowboy, broke back mountain man. Did he ever look for love in all the wrong places? Was he still holding on to the promise of the 80s? Did he ever surrender the same ways I had? And why do cowboys need Indians to survive? And could they even survive without Indians close by? Because then who would they chase or displace or erase? And could they ever learn to look you in the eye without a gun by their side? The road is ink smeared across, across plexiglass, a soft asphalt, the pressure of the human body, a palm rubbing into earthen clay, the left arm outstretched against the, against the breeze created by an automobile, fingers running along blades of grass, fingers like my ancestors, maps deteriorating in an abandoned cornfield, lines, demarcations, and borders softly disappear, fade and dissolve into the flesh of the earth. A rose is your rose, is my rose, is a body risen. The smell of a newborn body arose from the body of a continent, virgin, blistering with lava and boils and red hot soil that arose from my rose. You're a trail of petals from a rose that leads conquistadors off of steep cliffs that hypnotizes damned European sailors into plowing their ships into icebergs and hypnotizes horny, bloodthirsty, greedy Christians away from their places of worship puts their hands to good use by helping children to tend the soil or heal the sick and bless sacred queer bodies, sacred colonized bodies that rise from the ash of American flags in a field of technicolor roses that are roses and roses and rows of roses that arose from a war-torn land is a war-torn body, is a war-torn imaginary, is a war-torn madness that surrenders to you, my rose is a rose, was a rose, was a smell you leaned into for patience and serenity and a body free from disease or toxicity or the stress of capitalism and that pesky democracy in sheep's clothing? Why are we always reading the names of our dead? Things are worse outside of this picture, outside of this country, outside of this obedient mind. Who do we call when we don't feel safe by those who we never asked to protect us? Who do we call when we feel betrayed? The entirety of this world should be entirely as safe as the space created for white women who give birth to white children. We have always been in this political climate between colonizers and insurgents. To be a person in this country, to exist in this post-American crapshoot, is to be constantly under attack, is to shelter a compromised immune system. 
more brown bodies vilified and deconstructed to the point of dehumanization, reconstructed to fantasize the desirability of white skin and white thought and white religion and white politicians who turn massacre and heteropatriarchy into a tool to further their agenda aimed at violence, erasure, and bad boy security fantasy to infinity and beyond kind of orgasmic shit. When a white mouth speaks, it is holding a gun passed on from generation to generation. It is holding a sign written in English. It is a reminder of bad news and colonial violence. It is a manipulator and an instigator. It is an explorer and a rapist. It is a king and a queen. It is a conquistador and an urban planner and a map maker. It is a police force. It is an appropriated and therefore perverted constitution. It is a celebrity and it has 71 million followers. Forget American art, forget the smallpox blankets, forget the word for the white man, forget Columbus and every white president that came after, forget their faces, their gender, their preface, their fall from grace, their busted down broken hearts and burning homes, forget the American flag, forget the artifacts and alternative facts, forget their science and evolution, forget their history, forget their mythologies and astrological inquiries, their gods and goddesses and co-opted religions, forget their sexual empowerment, forget their inability to resist until centuries later, until enough brown bodies have died, until enough brown bodies have ignited the flame and shown them the way, until our resistance to their bullshit is a reminder is enough of a reminder for them to consider that we all have a right to survive. Forget their limits and borders and insecurities and intergenerational psychosis. Forget the way they kiss or cry or feel victorious. Forget their monuments and one-sided civil liberties. Forget their freedom and patriotism and traditions. Forget their faces searching your face for any acceptance or validation. But do not forget their language. Hold that against them like a non-complicit Bible or a knife or a gun. And then forget the gun and the knife and the Bible. My aesthetics are indigenous to this body crawling out of the earth. And there is no safe space in a colonized place. To be brave is sometimes not enough of reinforcement. Bravery is no armor, so don't fear the translation or lack thereof when colonized bodies attack one another like a virus. There is no victory on either end, and war is never followed by peace. Some of us are fighting our own wars with our bodies, the cancer slowly seeping in like radiation into the Pacific. I carve a place for myself in the desert floor of my ancestors as the clouds move through the valley and the sun undresses the land. I am a good Indian in this way. I talk with the uranium beneath my feet. It tells me that it is lonesome, it is warm-blooded and resilient, it is angry and it has just been violated, and in this way it is just as angry as an Indian. Most of America is beautiful, naturally without white supremacist artificial beauty. Most of America has potential, but white people ruin it. <laughs> they've ruined they've ruined everything they've ruined they've ruined ruins of my ancestors ruined my memory of myself they've destroyed the landscape punished their daughters glorified hell over the sanctity of water the body is a sacred site and we are mere extensions of the land gravity is a lover I call my home they extract things from my body, dig into my belly through my connection to my mother and remove something. They carved into the motherland of my body, my cradle of civilization where men will never carry the weight of another, will never know the weight of another. The origin of all creation stories where sound is first resurrected from an infinitesimal universe. Sometimes my hair is black fire sweeping through an infected landscape rotting with the corpses of white supremacy. I imagine I am one of my ancestors overlooking Segi and watching all the cornfields ablaze and then someone hits the fast forward button and suddenly I'm standing on the Washington side of the Columbia River Gorge watching a forest fire light up the sky in the black womb of night. I stop to blink my eyes and realize I'm actually sitting on the opposite side of a computer screen watching it documented in a GIF image, and the swell of devastation rolls over me like a musical score. 
my DNA predates the concept of a bitmap image, yet this is the way settler colonial trauma settles into the body of the colonized. We unconsciously relive the genocides and brutalities inflicted against our ancestors. The shame, the rape, the beatings, the white bodies with their killing machines, the distrust, the disease, the disgust, the miseducation, the deceit, the flamboyant uniforms asserting some imaginary power over the body of an other. My ancestors will not let me forget this, and every American flag is a warning sign even the one my grandfather was given as a co-talker. Sometimes my hair is black fire and it disintegrates all this trauma into non-existence for the future generation. It sends white people back to Europe and undoes centuries of betrayal and madness that they've inflicted against one another before they forgot the sources of their own traumas. It clears the scene of devastation and the music swells and there I am, naked, in a fetal position against the earth after the landscape has been cleansed of all this devastation. There is a silhouette of my body digging into the earth, and as the camera slowly pans out, I rise against the body of this earth like Scarlett O'Hara and clench a fist of my ancestral land into, into the palm of my hand, and in all my restored beauty I declare I will never be colonized again. Bless anime, anime aquash and red fawn fighting against colonial oppression and heteropatriarchy in the plains of Turtle Island. Bless the infants at Wounded Knee frozen to their mother's breasts as US soldiers shovel winter dirt into a collective grave. Bless the assimilated survivors who learned to speak and write through the language of the vicious colonizers their stories embroidered into the stars of the American flag, hoisted upside down from the top of Mount Rushmore to the Washington Monument to the blood-stained floors of Wall Street. Bless sacred indigenous queer and gender gradient magic, contagiously spreading through the land like ivy or influenza. Bless indigenous babies and landscapes conceived by indigenous women who give birth to indigenous futurisms. I want to say thank you to all the brown boys who made it out alive, through mothers who taught them how to love other brown boys, even if it wasn't intentional, even if it was never in their religion's best interest, or mothers who stopped being mothers simply because of the burden and unearthly origins of this, sec of this sexuality and theirs, mm -hmm. as two brown boys pull themselves into one another, close enough for healing, on a stoop in San Francisco south of Market. Somewhere Sade is playing with a love wider than the Great Lakes, taller than buildings built by Mohawks in the Empire State. And I think of all the beautiful brown, brown bodies sweating and kissing and celebrating one another, fucking their way back into existence or repopulating the res. And I think of all the beautiful brown babies born because of this kind of magic. All we know is our ancestors were wild as comets and cosmic wind. Imaginary love poem. It's, ama it's, it's amazing what another body can do when you thought you could do everything alone. Even the whisper of a touch can heal centuries of devastation and disease. Even another set of eyes can trigger the memory of satisfaction at the end of spring. We look up at the same night sky, but you are thousands of miles away, and I am jealous that you get to witness the sunset hours before I do. I want to be there beside you on a pier in New York City with New Jersey reminding me that an entire colonized continent lay before me with Trump signs and horrendous architecture. In dreams, you come to me like a movie scene with no soundtrack, and we stare longingly and desperate into one another, back before oil or fossils or homophobic pilgrims, before pyramids and Pangaea or mountain ranges that I call your body, before volcanoes and oceans, before the big bang or consciousness or momentum that propels time and evolution into the present moment. I wanna be more than human with you, more than this skin I am in, more than these thoughts and emotions, more than these sex organs and beauty standards, more than this colonized language, more than this decolonial poem resurrecting old lovers who knew how to hold my ancestors without the fear of white men wielding guns, Bibles, alcohol, meth, or circumcised cocks. 
I miss people who turn the sky back into a paradise of imagination. I imagine the soft bruise of a human body free falling to earth. And what if this poem wasn't my own truth? What if it has been traveling solar systems and genetic supernovas to reach this soil, to reach this moment when my body is healing and my hair has grown to the length that it is and my piss was as yellow as it is and after I've consumed half a bag of cherries and spit their seeds into a nearby parking lot and after he looked me in the eyes with those eyes that matched the river at midday and loved me in spite of all my flaws what truth do I own if the body I have called my home is borrowed from another time? I want to show you a trace of what was left after I found you. What piece of myself was left over from all my past lives to speak to you through a breeze and run my nails against your bark. The way a memory struggles against the force of forward motion and an aging body you've known intimately. The nooks and the smells and the blemishes the smell of alcohol mixed with cigarettes, the moment of surrender that brings your lips against their skin as your nostrils expand to memorize their sex. Why are we always reading the names of our dead? Or the fact that violence enacted against our community makes me want to inflict pain upon myself. So I bring in the words close to me like a knife and drag them into my skin until the poem begins to bleed and the words follow one another like a river of blood. Thank you. Mm -hmm.